Samwise the Brave. I want to hear more about Sam. In the heartwarming tale of The Lord of the Rings, a humble hobbit named Samwise Gamgee steps out from the cosy corners of the Shire and into the pages of history. Known to his friends as Sam, this kind-hearted gardener isn't just a sidekick. He's the backbone of an adventure that would shake the very foundations of Middle-earth. Walking beside the brave Frodo Baggins, Sam proves that the greatest heroes often come in the smallest packages. Build me a army worthy of Don't forget to show your support for this channel, hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, your engagement will really help the channel grow. I think I'll just have another ale. Oh no you don't. <laughs> Before Samwise Gamgee ever dreamt of dragons or dark lords, he was just Sam, a hobbit from a snug little place called the Shire in the lands of Eriador. The Shire was a peaceful and beautiful land, filled with rolling hills, babbling brooks, and sweet-smelling flowers. It was here, in a cosy hobbit hole, that Sam's story begins. Sam was born on the 6th of April in 2980 of the Third Age to a proud father, Hamfast the Gaffer Gamgee, who was known for his wisdom as much as his skill in tending gardens. The Gaffer worked for many years in the service of the Baggins family, a respected name in the Shire. Sam followed in his father's muddy footsteps, learning the trade of a gardener which was more than just a job for hobbits, it was a way of life. They grew not just plants, but a love for all things green and growing. As a boy, Sam spent his days with dirt under his fingernails and the sun warming his curly hair, surrounded by the smell of tilled earth and the blooming flowers. The Bagginses, especially Bilbo, were quite fond of Sam. Bilbo, the hobbit who had once gone on a grand adventure of his own, would often have Sam around. It was in Bilbo's garden that Sam learned more than just how to grow the best potatoes. He listened to Bilbo's tales of mountains that touched the sky and creatures that stirred in the dark. These stories planted seeds of wonder in Sam's heart, seeds that would one day grow into a yearning for his own adventures, even if he never quite knew it himself. Sam's father, the gaffer, always had a saying or two to share, and while he might not have intended it, his words often shaped Sam's view of the world. For example, in The Lord of the Rings, the gaffer shares a bit of hobbit wisdom. Elves and dragons, I says to him. Cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't go getting mixed up in the business of your betters, or you'll land in trouble too big for you, I says to him. This simple line, found in the early pages of The Lord of the Rings, shows the gaffer's practical nature, which Sam admired but also grew beyond as his own journey unfolded. The gaffer's down-to-earth advice and the wonders of Bilbo's stories mixed together in Sam's mind, creating a hobbit who was as practical as he was imaginative. It was in these early days, amidst the lilacs and the laughter, that the roots of Sam's character were nurtured, roots that would hold firm through the winds and storms to come. In this peaceful corner of the world, under the watchful eye of the gaffer and the inspiring tales of Bilbo, Sam grew strong and true. But even the most sheltered gardens can't keep the outside world away forever. Little did Sam know, his hands, used to soil and stem, would one day hold the fate of all Middle-earth. Don't worry, Sam. Rosie knows an idiot when she sees one. Does she? One day in that quiet shire where each day rolled like the gentle hills, Samwise Gamgee's life took a turn that was as unexpected as it was extraordinary. It all began on a seemingly ordinary day in the April of 3018, when Sam was doing what gardeners do best, tending to the flowers and herbs outside the window of Bag End, the home of Frodo Baggins. Unbeknownst to Sam, Inside that cosy hobbit hole, a conversation was taking place that would change the course of history. Gandalf the Grey, a wandering wizard of great power and wisdom, was speaking with Frodo about a ring. A ring of terrible danger that had to be kept secret, kept safe. Curiosity can be a funny thing, it can make you stick your nose where it perhaps shouldn't be. And stick it, Sam did, right up against that window, his ears straining to catch the wizard's words. But Gandalf was no fool, he caught the poor eavesdropping Sam right in the act. Have you been eavesdropping? I ain't been dropping no eaves, sir, honest. Sam's heart was pounding like a drum in his chest, his cheeks as red as tomatoes he so lovingly tended in that garden. Yet it was here, in this moment of mischief, that Sam's true journey began. Faced with the fear of the unknown and the stern gaze of Gandalf, 
Sam made a promise, a promise to stick by Mr Frodo and help him on his journey. The wizard saw something in Sam that perhaps Sam didn't even see in himself, a loyalty that was unshakable, a courage that was yet to be tested, and a heart that was larger than the Shire itself. With a gentle but firm nudge from Gandalf, Sam stepped outside his beloved garden and into the pages of legend. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. Although this conversation happened in April, Sam and Frodo, along with Peregrine Took or Pippin, would not leave the Shire until September, and their journey began with whispers of danger and the weight of secrecy. The road from Bag End to Rivendell would be long and perilous, yet Sam's determination did not waver. The plan was to get to Frodo's new home in Crick Hollow, in the eastern lands of the Shire, where they would then go and meet Meriadoc Brandybuck, known as Merry, and Fredegar Bolger, known as Fatty, as those two had gone ahead with Frodo's belongings. As they reached Woody End, the terrifying Nazgul were already on their tails. The first they hid from after barely setting off, and then the second would come close not long after. However, a group of elves, including Gildor Inglorion, an elf who already knew of Bilbo and Frodo, kept them safe at this time. Sam had always dreamt of meeting elves. So, this moment, it was like living a dream for him. In fact, we later learn that it was at this time that Sam showed another instance of the hobbit that he was becoming. We glimpse Sam's true loyalty with a snippet of his conversation with them, after Frodo reveals his intention to openly leave the Shire. If you don't come back sir, then I shan't, that's certain, said Sam. Don't you leave him, they said to me. Leave him? I said. I never mean to. I am going with him, if he climbs to the moon, and if any of those black riders try to stop him, they'll have Samwise Gamgee to reckon with, I said. They laughed. As the next day came, the elves were gone and the hobbits had to journey on. Eventually they came to Farmer Maggot's after one more black rider had been sighted. Farmer Maggot was a brave and kind soul who offered them refuge and guidance. He revealed to them that there had been a black rider snooping around his parts, asking for a baggins. He was extremely helpful and gave them a ride to Buckleberry Ferry, where, on their way, they also ran into Merry again, who had come back to look for them. Now at Frodo's new home in Crick Hollow, Frodo tried to reveal his plans, only for Sam and the others to instead reveal that they already knew everything. The conspirators were at large. They decided that Sam, Pippin and Merry were going to go with him, and Fatty was going to stay behind in the house to make sure that it looked like it was lived in. So, Sam now found himself entering into lands that he had never dared go as far as before. Their path first led them to the old forest, a place of ancient trees and whispering leaves, where the very woods themselves seemed alive with a will of their own. The hobbits, including Sam, were no strangers to tales of the forest's strange temper, yet nothing could have truly prepared them for the reality of it. The old forest played tricks on their senses, the paths seemed to twist on themselves. The hobbits soon found themselves trapped by the old will of Old Man Willow, a malevolent tree spirit. It was here that Sam's stout heart and practical nature first shone through, as he refused to abandon Hope or his master, Frodo. However, Hope wasn't going to be what saved them. Instead, their rescue came in the form of Tom Bombadil, a merry and enigmatic figure whose songs held sway over the ancient spirits of the forest. In Tom's house, Sam witnessed the peculiar magic and ancient law that lay outside the Shire's borders. The comfort and hospitality they received in Bombadil's home were a brief respite, and Sam's eyes were open to the depth and enchantment of the world beyond. Leaving Bombadil's care, they traversed the Barrow Downs, a land of grave mounds that held the remains of ancient men. Here they were ensnared by a Barrow White, and once again faced a peril that threatened to end their journey prematurely. However, Tom came and saved them again, and they could now finally make their way to Bree. When the hobbits finally reached the Bree land, Sam was already much changed from the hobbit who had timidly eavesdropped at Bag End. He had encountered wonders and dangers that those back home would scarce believe. Enough journeys for an entire lifetime, some might say, but we are far from done yet. As they arrived, the gatekeeper of Bree eyed them with suspicion, and Sam, with the others, felt the first sting of being an outsider in a world much bigger than they had known. In the inn of the Prancing Pony, amid the noise of unfamiliar voices and the stares of the Bree folk, they came to meet a mysterious ranger, a man who called himself Strider, later known as Aragorn. Sam was initially wary of this ranger, 
his mistrust reflecting his loyalty to Frodo. Yet in time, he would see the kingliness in Strider, learning that even a weather-worn exterior could hide a noble heart. After hearing Strider's words and Frodo receiving a letter from Gandalf, the hobbits agreed they could really trust him, and so decided to leave with him and make for Rivendell, the home of Lord Alrond, another elf. The group would buy a pony for their journey too, one that Sam would love dearly, naming him Bill. The road from Bree to Rivendell was a stark departure from the cobblestone paths of Hobbiton. They traversed the Midgewater marshes and reached the old watchtower of Weathertop in early October. Here, the Black Riders struck. The Witch King of Angmar stabbed Frodo. Aragorn fought them off, and then they had a race against time on their hands to get the wounded Frodo to Rivendell. Two weeks later, they reached the fords of Bruinin, where Frodo, weakened from his wound, would have been taken but for the courage of his friends. Sam, though terrified, was unflinching, ready to throw himself against the tide of evil if it meant safeguarding his friend. And as the waters rose at Alron's command to wash away their foes, Sam beheld the power and grace of the elves in a way that songs could never really capture. Upon reaching Rivendell, Sam was enveloped in a world that surpassed his dreams. Here was a sanctuary of peace and ancient wisdom, a stark contrast to the darkness that had chased them. His arrival at the House of Alron marked not just the end of one journey, but the beginning of another, grander one. And as Samwise rested and healed in this haven, his spirit tempered like steel, ready for the trials that awaited him beyond the safety of Rivendell's borders. Mr. Frodo's not going anywhere without me. Just a few days into their stay, the Council of Alrond was held. Frodo volunteered to take the One Ring to Mordor, and Sam would not leave his master's side, even if he hadn't been invited to the Council in the first place. The Fellowship of the Ring would be formed with nine members. Two men, one elf, one dwarf, one wizard, and four hobbits. And two months later, on December 25th of 3018 to be precise, the Fellowship departed from Rivendell. Samwise Gamgee trod with heavy feet, laden not only with his pack, but the weight of a promise. He followed his dear Mr. Frodo into the wild. Their first path was to take the way of the Redhorn Pass, but the weather turned against them this way, so they had to turn back. And so, by January 13th, the West Gates of Moria loomed before them, an ancient testament to dwarven grandeur now whispered as a name of dread. It was here, at the Dark Water's Edge, where they encountered the Watcher in the Water, the beast with tentacles like writhing serpents, struck with sudden ferocity. It was a battle that demanded all the courage that they could muster. For Sam, though, the horror was twofold, as his faithful pony, Bill, was forced to flee into the wild as the mines were no place for him. The loss struck Sam with grief as sharp as a blade. Bill was more than a beast of burden. He was a friend, and Sam mourned his parting. The party would then make their way through the mines, and they would fight the orcs in the chamber of Mazarbal. Here, it appears that Frodo is mortally wounded. However, thanks to a handy gift of Mithril from Bilbo, Sam does not have to deal with that loss as well. Moving shortly on, Gandalf falls after standing against the Balrog at the Bridge of khazad with both ultimately falling into the unknown depths below. And so, Aragorn takes up leadership of the Fellowship, as Sam is left dealing with the losses of both Gandalf and Bill. Into February now, the Fellowship have made their way into the Golden Wood of Lothlorien, under the watchful eyes of Lady Galadriel and Lord Celeborn. Sam is offered a glimpse into the mirror of Galadriel. Through that watery glass, he saw the scouring of the Shire, his home and heart's delight laid waste. His spirit wavered, torn between the quest and the Shire's need. It was a crucible of loyalty, where the depth of his devotion to Frodo and the task at hand was sorely tested. After a fierce internal battle, Sam's choice was made. He would not abandon Frodo. The sight of the Shire's ruin planted a seed of determination within him to protect what he could and mend what he might, should he ever return home. On February 16th, Sam and the Fellowship embarked upon the waters of the Anduin. At their parting from Lorien, Galadriel gave Sam a box containing earth from her orchard. As the Fellowship journeyed down the river, the Ring's presence became a silent whisper of dread threatening to unravel their unity. On February 26th, Frodo decided to leave the Fellowship on his own after a confrontation with Boromir. However, the Ringbearer's intended solitude was short-lived as Sam, ever watchful and unwavering, perceived Frodo's intent, and without hesitation, he plunged into the water, his determination to accompany Frodo outweighing his lack of skill in swimming. As Frodo grasped Sam's sinking form, their bond was sealed tighter than ever, and together they set forth on the path that would lead them into the shadow of Mordor. As 
circled. With it now just being Frodo and Sam, they made their way into the towering cliffs of the Emin Wheel, where the rocks seemed to claw at the sky. Here, Gollum, a creature twisted by the Ring's dark influence, emerged from shadow to reclaim his precious. On February 29th, the creature pounced with wild eyes and wicked intent. Sam's hand reached for his blade, his mind set on ending the threat. Yet, it was Frodo who stayed the killing blow, binding Gollum with words of promise, a vow to lead them safely to Mordor, a vow on the precious. Sam watched with wary eyes, his heart filled with mistrust but bound by Frodo's merciful command. Their journey to reach the Black Gate, although tense with heavy presence of lurking foes, was not too bad despite passing through the dead marshes and culminated on March 5th. As they reached the gate that stood as a daunting sentinel and watched over by many cruel eyes of all kinds of evil, they realised that the way was barred. The path seemed lost. Yet, in the moment of despair, Gollum spoke of a secret way, a path untrod by the enemy. Sam's suspicion of the creature grew, every hiss, every furtive glance suggested betrayal. Nonetheless, they followed, for the quest demanded risk, even if it meant trusting the untrustworthy. As the trio ventured southward, the year passed into March, and through the verdant land of Ithilien, the War of the Ring revealed its far-reaching grasp. An oliphant, massive and majestic, crossed their path, bearing warriors of Harrod. Sam, ever the dreamer of tales and wonders, found a moment of joy in the midst of fear, reciting a poem about the beast of legend he never thought he'd see. Sam stood up, putting his hands behind his back as he always did when speaking poetry, and began. Grey as a mouse, big as a house. Nose like a snake, I make the earth shake. As I tramp through the grass, trees crack as I pass. With horns in my mouth, I walk in the south. Flapping big ears, beyond count of years. I stump round and round, never lie on the ground. Not even to die, Oliphant am I. Biggest of all, huge, old, and tall. If you ever meet me, you wouldn't forget me. If you never do, you won't think I'm true. But old Oliphant am I, and I never lie. The wonder was short-lived, for soon after, Faramir, captain of Gondor, brother of Boromir, took them for spies. In private, Sam accidentally let slip about the ring, but Faramir managed to resist it, and in turn, both parties gained each other's trust, and they were let go the next day. Their journey continued, they passed the crossroads of the Fallen King and then on to the dark of Kirithungal by March 13th, a place where evil slept but never died. As they reached Minas Morgul, Gollum showed the hobbits the secret stairs that led up to the home of the great spider, Shelob, a creature from nightmares. Gollum had set them up, and it was here that Frodo fell to her poisonous sting. At that moment, Samwise faced terror incarnate, with the light of Galadriel in one hand and Sting in the other, he fought with a courage that defied his small stature, being the first person, man, elf, dwarf, or hobbit, to ever inflict a wound to the beast. The spider retreated, bested by the might of a hobbit's heart. With Frodo seemingly lifeless, despair gripped Sam. The weight of the ring was his to bear, and with a heavy heart, he resolved to complete the task alone, for Frodo. But fate was twisted again when orc voices revealed that Frodo was in fact still alive, captured but not lost, paralysed by the poison of the spider. Sam's journey had led him to the darkest pits, yet within him burned a light undimmed, a hope unquenched. That's for Frodo! That's for the Shire! And that's for my own gaffer! Samwise Gamgee, driven by loyalty and love, scaled the orc haunted passages of Kirith Ungol. Frodo lay in the darkness, bound and helpless, but Sam was on his way. Sam found a far emptier place than he had expected due to the internal slaughter of the Battle of Kirith Ungol. So, upon their reunion, he returned the ring to Frodo, illustrating his remarkable resistance to his malevolent pull. The departure from Kirith Ungol on March 15th was but the beginning of an arduous path through the desolation of Mordor. The very air was a poison, and the land a testament to the Dark Lord's ruinous reign. It was here on March 18th, they are then forced to join a line of orcs marching towards the Black Gate the next day. With cunning and quiet tenacity, they sparked confusion and slipped from the clutches of Sauron's minions. The plains of Gorgoroth lay before them, an expanse of barren waste that drained hope with each passing step. Over the next five days, the hobbits traversed this hellish landscape, driven by a single purpose of destroying the Ring. Upon reaching the slopes of Mount Doom on March 25th, the burden of the Ring weighed heavily upon Frodo. Sam, ever the source of steadfast support, reminded him of the Shire, 
of the memories of home that they fought so hard to preserve. Yet, Frodo, ensnared by the ring's crushing influence, admitted that he could no longer recall such beauty. When Frodo's strength was failing, Sam's did not. He took his friend upon his back, carrying him up the mountain, embodying his earlier vow, to carry Frodo when the ring could not be carried alone. It was on this harrowing climb that they encountered Gollum once more. In a scuffle, Sam proved his mettle by wounding the creature, but not killing him, for he now understood what it meant to be one of the ring bearers, what that ring truly did to a wearer's mind. But in the cracks of doom, also known as Samoth Naur, Sam's journey reached its zenith. He witnessed Frodo, unable to relinquish the ring, claiming it for himself. The ring is mine. It was then that Gollum's intervention, though violent and tragic, led to the ring's end. In his lust for the precious, Gollum secured his own doom and inadvertently tripped the world's salvation as he tumbled into the inferno. As the ring melted away, so too did Sauron's dark dominion. Sam, knocked down, could not have known how close they had come to failure, nor how their smallest of deeds had led to the greatest of victories. The rescue by Gandalf and the Eagles marked the beginning of the Hobbit's return to the world that they had saved. The Shire awaited, though they had been changed by their quest in ways that their fellow Hobbits could scarcely understand. Samwise Gamgee, the heroic gardener, had journeyed from Frodo's capture to the very brink of doom and back again. His humble courage, his loyalty, and his heart, unspoiled by the darkness of the ring, carried them through. His deeds were the quiet acts of bravery and love that echo through Middle-earth's history, a reminder that even the smallest of creatures can change the course of the future. However, as much as you think this should be the end, Sam's journey is not over yet. Sam sat back now that the quest was completed. He and Frodo were honoured at the Field of Cormallon and were there at the coronation of Aragorn into King Elisar II. Eventually, by the beginning of November, after a stopgap in Rivendell on their way, he would come to travel back to the Shire with Frodo, Merry and Pippin. When they finally set foot back in their home, he found not the peaceful green fields that he had left behind, but a land shadowed by trouble. It was a shock that would stir any heart, a stark contrast to the memories of home that had been the guiding light in the darkness of Mordor. The Shire had been overtaken by ruffians and despoilers, and the very earth that Sam loved was crying out for aid. However, this was, of course, not the same Sam who had left. He was not simply the same hobbit that had once tended the gardens, and he was now prepared to heal his entire homeland. They discovered the leader behind this atrocity was someone called Sharky, who they discovered to actually be Saruman, the disgraced wizard. He had polluted the Shire, wanting revenge on the halflings, but with the return of the hobbits, Saruman was overthrown. The very essence of the Shire was resilience and strength, a parallel to Sam's own nature. In the restoration that followed, Sam's efforts were akin to tending a garden after winter's harshness. Remember, he'd been given a box of earth by the Lady Galadriel, a gift with properties of renewal and growth. The finest garden in the Shire, he said, intent on bringing life back to the places where darkness had passed. He planted, he nurtured, and with care, he watched the Shire blossom once more under his hands. And in those hands, the hands of Samwise Gamgee, the Shire found its heart again, and in its healing, so too did the rest of the hobbits find their own resilience and hope rekindled. With peace restored to the Shire, Sam Gamgee began a new chapter of his life, one marked by love, leadership, and lasting legacies. Sam married Rosie Cotton, a cheerful hobbit lass that he had long, long admired. The life together was filled with laughter, love, and a growing family, becoming the father of 13 children. Sam was also honoured by those of the Shire by being given the name of Gardener for all the healing that he had done to their lands. In time, at the end of the Third Age, Frodo would leave those lands and sail to the west. The wounds that he had suffered could never heal. So, Sam was left back end, as well as being entrusted with the Red Book of Westmarch by Frodo, which contained the history of the Ring and its destruction, although he never truly felt like this was goodbye. Sam's role in the Shire blossomed beyond his family life. The Hobbits, recognising his courage and wisdom, elected him the Mayor of Hobbiton not once, but seven times as Tolkien notes, a testament to their trust and respect for him. His leadership was gentle yet firm, kind-hearted yet wise, and also with the good of the Shire at heart. Sam had vowed that the Shire became more beautiful than ever, with gardens blooming in vibrant colours and trees standing tall and proud. 
The years passed and sadly, eventually, his dear wife Rosie passed away, and Sam knew that his time in the Shire was now drawing to a close too. In the appendices of The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien reveals a poignant and final chapter to Sam's story. With Rosie gone, Sam passed the Red Book of Westmarch to his daughter Eleanor, then, as it is told, Sam rode to the Grey Havens where he boarded an elven ship to sail across the sea to the Undying Lands, a place of eternal rest and peace where he would once again be reunited with Frodo. He was granted this gift and honour as, even if it was just for a short time, he had been one of the Ring Bearers. This departure is rich with symbolism. Sam, who had not only been the steadfast guardian and healer, was now entrusted with his own healing. His journey to the Undying Lands signifies a reward for his undying spirit and a testament to the impact one individual can have on the world. It echoes the bittersweet nature of life itself, where all stories, no matter how full of heart and courage, come to an end. Sam's last sight of Middle-earth would be the white towers gleaming in the setting sun, as mentioned in the last lines about Frodo, surely Sam would have experienced the same thing. And the ship went out into the high sea and passed on into the west. Until at last on a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that as in his dream in the house of Bombadil, the grey rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back. And he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. So there we have it, Samwise Gamgee's tale from the Shire to the Undying Lands is a moving example of the greatness inherent in the seemingly ordinary. Beginning as a gardener, his fidelity and bravery sculpted him into a hero of Middle-earth's lore, showcasing that true heroism springs from the gentlest of beings. His story unfolded gradually, each stride from Bag End to Mordor revealing his true character. When fate called, Sam showed that the smallest can shift the course of history, resonating with one of Tolkien's core messages. The impact of Sam's deeds is lasting, reflected in the Shire's healed beauty and the enduring theme of Tolkien's work the profound significance of kindness and the narrative worth of every individual. Sam, the humble gardener turned hero, exemplifies that bravery has many faces, and steadfast love lights even the darkest roads. Sam's epic is more than fantasy, it is a parable for our potential for greatness, a testament to the strength of a good heart, and an enduring beacon of hope. Samwise, the hero gardener, endures as a source of inspiration within Tolkien's legacy, and beyond. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. And with that now it is time for my question of the day, which is, do you agree with the statement that Sam is the true hero of the Lord of the Rings, or do you think that it is in fact someone else? Probably Frodo. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section down below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys are continuing to support our short film The Guard. We are making good progress and I cannot thank you all enough. We of course have the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheath and the Wizard Staff tier members of Andrew and Hunter. So finally, if you've managed to reach the end of this video today and you really enjoyed what you've seen, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button and getting that bell icon with all notifications ticked so that you will know when all future uploads go up. And so, thank you for spending just some of your time with me today, and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword. Potatoes! Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew! <laughs>